from New Delhi. You're watching TD India News Ideas, Voice to the World. I'm Lipakshi Khurana coming up in the next hour. Rescue efforts continue in Taiwan. Nine people killed and over 1,000 injured in 7.4 earthquake struck island's eastern coast. Pressure mounts on Israel after their strike on aid workers. White House says President Biden outraged. U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin calls Israeli counterpart urge a swift and transparent probe. Mortal remains of foreign aid workers killed in Israeli strike transported to Egypt for repatriation. UN suspends aid movements at night in Gaza. Campaigning underway in full swing for India's general elections. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi to hold public rallies in Bihar and West Bengal. to the details now. Emergency reinforcement works are being carried out after a 7.3 magnitude earthquake hit China's Taiwan region on Wednesday morning. The quake severely tilted, tilted many high-rise buildings. A 10-story structure that housed a mix of homes and shops was tilted over and appeared to be on the verge of collapse. The fire department reported a 5 centimeter increase in the building displacement, indicating the rise or risk of collapse due to constant aftershocks. The fire department also dispatched tower cranes, excavators and trucks to position large rocks to support the structure and prevent its full collapse. Many residents managed to flee when shockwaves hit with rescuers working to free people trapped inside. As per the local emergency operations center, the quake had left nine people dead and more than 900 people have been injured. Well, some buildings tilted at precarious angles in the mountainous, sparsely populated county of Huelen near the epicenter of the quake. The quake also triggered massive landslides. 50 workers traveling in minibuses to a hotel in a national park were missing. The earthquake hit at a depth of 15.5 kilometers as people were headed for work and school. Many residents who dared not to stay at home overnight were accepted at temporary shelters. The fire authorities said they had already evacuated around 70 people trapped in tunnels near Hualien City. Meanwhile, Taiwan has started the demolition of hazardous buildings in Hualien, which were badly damaged by the quake. Excavators were seen tearing down buildings which have been marked for demolition in the Hualien County. Mayor Hasu Chenewei said the demolition of the four tilted buildings would take at least two days, with residents and businesses evacuated. She added rescuers continued their search. 目前为止呢，这个康熙女老师应该是快要被送。目前在现场的话，有一位康熙的民众。We hope to complete the demolition in two days' time. There are four buildings in total. The buildings are tilted and they are at security risk. After discussing with the residents and turning off the water pipes and security, we started the demolition. Well, the powerful earthquake was also captured by the cameras in a newsroom during a live broadcast. The anchors on air kept speaking and delivering news while the studio was visibly shaken and lights swaying violently overhead. And Taiwan rescuers dispatched helicopters to airlift people trapped in the mountainous areas of Hualien. The tremor focused on the largely rural and sparsely populated eastern county of Hualien.
DD India's Patrick Falk reports for more from Ground Zero. One of those demolition jobs you were talking about just a moment ago is taking place right here behind me. This is a 37-year-old commercial building that, as you can see, was badly affected by the quake. It's been on a heavy tilt since the quake struck yesterday, and now workers are busy trying to bring it down. And as far as I understand, what they're doing is they're building up a rubble in front of the building so they can then lay it forward gently, as it were, it does look as though it could be coming down any moment now because they're boarding up the area around it to, to protect the people that are uh, watching the situation right now. But, you know, what's remarkable here in Hualien is that this is actually the exception and there are very few peoples that have fared as badly as this. Most of the other buildings around uh, are still standing. They are still intact. So there are some questions being asked about the uh, integrity the structural integrity of buildings uh, that have been badly damaged and questions being raised about whether or not anyone is to blame. But as we know, buildings in Taiwan is prone to earthquakes, so uh, buildings are built to withstand these sorts of disasters and they were really put to the test yesterday. Yeah, well, the tsunami warnings were taken down pretty soon after the initial quake struck yesterday. But, you know, as I say, this situation is incredibly uncertain. There have been more than 200 aftershocks, according to some experts, some of them measuring a greater than magnitude 6 on the Richter scale. And authorities have said that the further shocks that are expected over the course of the next three or four days could be nearly as big as that initial quake uh, that hit yesterday and as we've said before many times this is the largest earthquake that Taiwan has experienced in at least 25 years and you know speaking to people here they have been emotionally and physically shaken by it most people have never seen anything like this before they've described a sort of violent shaking that took place uh, yesterday and uh, they're all hoping that uh, there won't be any sort of uh, repeat of what they saw and pressure mounts on Israel after the airstrike on aid workers. U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin on Wednesday urged Israel to take concrete steps to protect aid workers and civilians in Gaza. In a call with his Israeli counterpart, Yuav Gallant, Secretary Austin expressed his outrage at the Israeli strike on a World Central Kitchen humanitarian aid convoy that killed seven aid workers including an American citizen. Pentagon in a statement said that Austin also urged Gallon to conduct a swift and transparent investigation to share the conclusions publicly and to hold those responsible to account. Well, the United States says it wants to see a swift Israeli investigation into an attack that killed seven aid workers of World Central Kitchen in Gaza. The State Department spokesperson told media that Israel needs to put in place better deconfliction and coordination measures to protect humanitarian workers and civilians on the ground. The Israelis have said to us and they've said publicly that they intend to conduct this investigation swiftly. Um, we want to see it wrapped up as soon as possible. Um, and see them put in place any measures to prevent this from happening again in the future. And that's the, go to the second point that we think we need to see. Not just, and they don't have to wait for the outcome of this investigation to do it. They need to put in place better deconfliction and better coordination measures to protect humanitarian workers and to protect all the civilians on the ground. Also, the White House said President Biden was outraged and heartbroken for the death of seven aid workers by an Israeli air strike in Gaza. Biden on Tuesday called the charity aid group's founder to share his condolences. Biden told World's Chicken Kriegame founder Joe Andres that he will make clear to Israel that aid workers must be protected. He's outraged and he's heartbroken. We are all heartbroken here by those seven lives lost. And so we are going to continue to mourn uh, with them, with, um, with, the, with Chef Jose Andres and obviously the families. An Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albany slammed Israel's explanation for aid attack. Albany said that Israel's explanation for killing seven aid workers is insufficient and unacceptable. Israel said on Tuesday it mistakenly killed workers of charity World Central Kitchen. We need to have accountability for how it's occurred. And what isn't good enough 
is the statements that have been made, uh, including that uh, this is just a product of war. Uh, this is against humanitarian law. International humanitarian law makes it very clear that aid workers uh, should be able to provide that aid and that assistance free of the threat of losing their life. An update now in Israel-Hamas conflict. The United Nations has suspended movements at night in Gaza for at least 48 hours to evaluate security issues following the killing of staff working for the World Central Kitchen Food Charity. The suspension started on Tuesday. The World Food Program is continuing operations during the day. We've suspended our nighttime uh, movements within the Gaza Strip for at least 48 hours to allow for further evaluation of the security issues uh, that impact our uh, personnel on the ground and of course the civilian population we are efforting to help. And this follows um, the killing of the uh, World, World Central Kitchen staff on uh, Monday. Um, that's of course for nighttime movements during the day. Our colleagues of the World Food Program tell us that operations are continuing including daily efforts to send convoys to the north. And in an emotional interview to Reuters news agency, celebrity chef Joe Zandres said that an Israeli attack that killed seven of his food aid workers in Gaza had targeted them systematically, car by car. The team was coming from dropping in a warehouse we had uh, south of Gaza in Dar es Salaam. Uh, all the food they were able to download before uh, it got too dark. We were in an area that is kind of a secure area, what they call a deconflicting area, and was two armored cars, plus one soft, uh, one soft shell. And, and the teams were, uh, as far as we know, already uh, coming back from the warehouse in a way. They were targeted systematically, car by car, also, speaking via video, Andres said that IDF was aware of the convoy's whereabouts. He called for investigations of the incident by the U.S. government and by the home country of every aid worker who was killed. It happened over more than 1.5, 1.8 kilometers. So this was not just a bad luck situation where, oops, uh, we dropped the bomb in the wrong place or... Or no, this was over 1.5, 1.8 kilometers with a very defined humanitarian convoy that had signs in the top, in the roof, uh, a very colorful logo that we are obviously very proud of, but that, that's very clear who we are and what we do. And the World Central Kitchen founder condemned the war as a whole. The humanitarians and civilians should never be paying the consequences of war. This is a basic principle of humanity. At the, at the time, this looks like it's not a war against terrorism anymore. Seems this is a war against humanity itself. Well, the mortal remains of eight workers who were killed by an Israeli airstrike in Gaza arrived in Egypt on Wednesday. An ambulance convoy carrying the mortal remains crossed Rafah border after departing Gaza early on Wednesday. The bodies of the foreign aid workers were handed over to UN officials at the Egyptian border for transport home. The strike late on Monday night hit a convoy of three vehicles and killed a seven staff of the aid group World Central Kitchen, including citizens of Australia, Britain and Poland, a dual citizen of the United States and Canada as well as a Palestinian colleague who was buried at his home. Israel said it mistakenly killed the aid workers and promised a full investigation. And a sea convoy of undelivered food for Gaza returned to Cyprus on Wednesday after the killing of aid workers of World Central Kitchen in an Israeli airstrike on Monday evening. A cargo ship carrying 240 tons of food initially destined for the people of Gaza sailed back to Larnaca in Cyprus following the deadly attack, dropping anchor just outside the port. A second ship, the Open Arms, owned by a Spanish NGO working with WCK, arrived earlier. The undelivered aid was part of a consignment of about 340 tons sent to Gaza from Cyprus on March 30th. The aid workers killed in Gaza had just finished work unloading 100 tons from a barge also sent from Cyprus. WCK, active in Gaza since October, has paused operations in the territory after the killings and turned around its flotilla of ships back to Cyprus.
An Israel war cabinet member, Benny Gantz, called for national elections in September on Wednesday as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's government faces pressure at home and abroad over the Gaza conflict. Gantz said he believed an agreed election date would allow Israeli society to renew its contract with its leadership. Gantz, a former army general, joined Netanyahu's government in the early days of a war as a gesture of political unity during the crisis that uh, the Israeli society needs to renew its contract with its leadership and I think the only way to do it and still maintaining the national effort in fighting Hamas and terrorist group and other security challenges is by having an agreed election date that we have to discuss when and if. And still to come on DD India News now. NATO marks 75th anniversary of the signing of the North Atlantic Treaty. Thousands flee from Haiti amid surging violence. And South African Parliament Speaker resigns amid corruption probe. As a cycle of accountability returns, the time has come when the biggest democracy chooses to write another chapter in its glorious history. Development, justice, regionalism, a big political canvas. Everything will be put to test in this mega battle for glory. DD India dissects what makes elections 2024. The battle royale in Indian politics. Data and analysis free from bias to help you understand why India matters. Great Indian election on weekdays at 8.30 p.m. only on TV India. Welcome back. You're watching DD India News. I'm Nepak Shikurana and moving on, NATO foreign ministers will meet on Thursday to celebrate the 75th anniversary of their alliance, having agreed to start planning for a greater role in coordinating military aid to Ukraine. On Thursday, the ministers will also meet with the Ukrainian foreign minister, Dmitry Kuleba. On the second day of a meeting in Brussels, the ministers will mark the signing of the Washington Treaty on April 4, 1949, of the North Atlantic Treaty that established the transatlantic political and military alliance. NATO began with 12 members from North America and Europe. At its heart is the concept of collective defense. 75 years later, NATO has 32 members and has retaken a central role in world affairs. On Wednesday, NATO ministers agreed to start planning for a greater NATO role in coordinating security assistance and training for Ukraine. Also, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken hailed a bigger, stronger, more united NATO in Brussels on Wednesday as part of an event with the alliance's foreign ministers. Blinken also thanked Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg for his work towards strengthening NATO. The fact that the alliance has not only weathered this crisis, but emerged bigger, stronger, more united than ever, is in no small part because of Ambassador Smith's leadership. None of us could have hoped for a greater champion for this alliance uh, than Jens Stoltenberg. Um, no one could have done a better job holding us together when others were trying to divide us. No one could have done a better job really carrying the alliance forward. Well, Finland's president on Wednesday signed a 10-year security deal with Ukraine in Kyiv, where President Vladimir Zelensky said he believed Russia planned to mobilize 300,000 new troops for its war by June. The pact signed by President Alexander Stubb and Zelensky made Finland the eighth NATO member this year to commit to long-term security cooperation and defense backing for Kyiv as it battles to hold back Russian forces. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said the Ukrainian president's assertion about a new Russian mobilization was untrue. And later in his nightly video address, Zelensky said he had discussed plans and tactics with Ukraine's top military commander, Alexander Sirisky, including defending out positions, Ukraine's pressure on Russian positions, and key plans for defensive and offensive actions in the near future. He added that Ukraine clearly understands what Russia is preparing for. 
четко разуми. And we, all of us, our partners, must have a strong response to Russian operations, any Russian operations. We must win this war. While three rescue workers were killed in Russian drone attack on Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, early on Thursday, Kharkiv regional governor said the rescue workers were killed after they had arrived at the scene of the attack and a new strike occurred. He said a total of four strikes had hit the city and the top floors of one apartment building had been damaged. Kharkiv mayor said one strike had triggered a fire, part of another building had collapsed. And South Africa's National Assembly Speaker, Nozivev Mapisa Nakakula, has resigned amid an investigation into alleged corruption during her tenure as Defence Minister. The resignation, which is effective immediately, also saw her stepping down as a member of the Parliament. Mapisa Nakakula is accused of soliciting bribes in return for awarding contracts during her time as Defence Minister. She has denied the charges and said her resignation was in no way an indication or admission of guilt. The 67-year-old veteran of the anti-apartheid struggle became speaker in 2021. Before that, she served as defense minister for seven years. And Senegal's newly elected president, Basiro Diomaye Fai, said that an audit of the oil, gas and mining sectors will be conducted soon. In a televised address to the nation, Fai said he will proceed with the disclosure of the effective ownership of extractive companies with an audit of the mining, oil and gas sector. The audit is one of the first policy moves announced since the 44-year-old former tax inspector's inauguration on Tuesday. Fai, during his address, reassured investors that their rights will always be protected in Senegal. Well, tens of thousands of people have fled the Haitian capital, Port-au-Prince, in past weeks in a desperate bid to escape a surge in gang violence. That's according to the United Nations, which says the scale of human rights abuse taking place there is unprecedented in modern Haitian history. Did India's Benji Har have been following the developments there? UN figures suggest more than 50,000 Haitians escaped the country's main city in a matter of weeks during March amid a deadly conflict between powerful armed gangs. Killings, kidnappings and sexual violence have forced residents to rural areas which the United Nations here in the US warns are not equipped to deal with such a huge influx of people. These are areas still recovering from a devastating earthquake just a few years ago. Now, some have sought to cross into the Dominican Republic, but the government there has bolstered border security and deported tens of thousands of displaced civilians back across to Haiti. The poverty-stricken Caribbean state has been in the throes of an internal crisis, teetering on the collapse and a potential civil war as gangs took over swathes of the nation. The Prime Minister, Ariel Henry, resigned last month from the US territory of Puerto Rico to Haiti's east on the same day that the United States announced an additional 100 million US dollars to finance the deployment of a multinational force to assist Haitian police. On Monday, Haiti's de facto government issued a statement saying its leaders were working toward a peaceful transition of power as fast as possible. Benji Haya in Washington, reporting for DD India. And severe weather wreaked havoc across the Mideast of the United States with a succession of tornadoes wreaking damage on infrastructure, residences and communal areas. As the intense storm hit the eastward, states such as Ohio, Pennsylvania and Indiana. The weather authorities have cautioned the storms to persist. Regions in eastern Virginia and upper North Carolina could face severe thunderstorms as an unstable weather front gradually extends southeastward. Well, rural communities in South and Central Mexico battled the flames as dozens of wildfire raged boosted by a nationwide drought. Fires ravaged the central state of Mexico, 
doubts that originated in a corn field. Other wildfires raged on remote mountain ranges and virgin jungles and forests. According to Mexico's Forest National Commission, there were 71 active fires on Tuesday. And now let's take a look at other stories making news around the world. The Syrian Ministry of Defense conducts a ceremony to honor the seven Iranian killed in an airstrike on the Iranian embassy in Damascus. Iran's ambassador in Syria, Hussein Akbari, was among those who attended the ceremony. Wired up coffee plants help farmers counter climate change. At Otengule Coffee Farms, researchers are monitoring 20 Arabica coffee plants that are wired up across the plantation. Each plant is attached to electrodes that monitor the heat and warmth of the atmosphere. Using this technology will provide researchers the continuous updates on their health and hydration. Multiple Apple services, including the App Store, Apple TV Plus and Apple Music, were down on Wednesday for users in the United States. Approx 6,400 users reported issues at the peak of the outage. Over 1,000 user reports for both Apple TV Plus and Apple Music were there. French comedy, the second act, will open this year's 77th Cannes Film Festival, the organizers confirmed on Wednesday. Many movies from across the world to showcase their talent to the big screen of French movie theaters. This year's Cannes Film Festival runs from May 14th to May 25th. Thousands of people took to the streets in Turkey's southeastern city of Van to celebrate an election board decision restoring poor Kurdish mayor-elect Abdullah Zaydan to his post. Zaydan from the DEM party was elected on Sunday's local elections, prompting people to once again pour into the streets in bigger crowds than in the morning to celebrate. And still to come in DD India News now. President of India Draupadi Murmu will launch the anti cancer county cell therapy and will dedicate it to the nation in IIT Bombay. And Russian Deputy Chief of Mission Roman Babushkin hailed India's remarkable achievements in space exploration. And today is the last day for filing nominations for constituencies in phase two of general elections. India that invents. India that innovates. India that excites. India that invites. Land of possibility. Teeming with opportunities. Watch India Ideas each Thursday, 8 p.m. only on DD India. The largest state of India, Rajasthan, goes to polls in two phases. The Battle Royale for 25 Lok Sabha seats. What are the issues on the ground and who will create a storm? Join us on DD India on the Great Indian Elections, Thursday at 8.30 p.m. IST and 1500 hours GMT, only on DD India. How did the People's Republic of China capture Tibet back in the day? Is it time to consider a social media ban for kids? Watch Connecting the Dots to get the full picture every Friday at 8 p.m. IST on DD India. Welcome back. You're watching DD India News. I'm Nipak Shikurana and time now for a quick recap of the headlines. 
Rescue efforts continue in Taiwan. Nine people killed and over 1,000 injured in 7.4 earthquake struck island's eastern coast. Pressure mounts on Israel after their strike on aid workers. White House says President Biden outraged. U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin calls Israeli counterpart urges swift and transparent probe. Mortal remains of foreign aid workers killed in Israeli strike transported to Egypt for repatriation. UN suspends aid movements at night in Gaza. And campaigning underway in full swing for India's general elections. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi to hold public rallies in Bihar and West Bengal. And moving on, President of India Draupadi Murmu will visit Mumbai on Thursday to launch India's first homegrown gene therapy for cancer at IIT Bombay. The President will also dedicate it to the nation on the occasion. CAR T therapies are used mainly to treat blood cancers and have burgeoned in the past few years. The Indian CAR T therapy cost one tenth that of comparable commercial products available globally. And Russian Deputy Chief of Mission Roman Babushkin hailed India's remarkable achievements in space exploration and underscored Russia's unwavering support for its space endeavors. On the 40th anniversary of the space flight of the first Indian astronaut, cosmonaut Rakesh Sharma aboard the Soviet spacecraft Soyuz T-11 on April 3, 1984, Babushkin emphasized the enduring partnership between Russia and India in the space sector. Babushkin's remarks also highlight the success of the Chandrayaan-3 mission and the collaborative efforts in the Gaganyaan project. Notably, he commemorated the achievements of Rakesh Sharma, who etched his name in history as India's first astronaut. Russia has always been favoring the Indian success. India has developed uh, its own uh, space research program and it uh, helps other countries to launch satellites and uh, um, uh, of course the Chandrayaan-3 mission is a great success. Russia is a sincere well-wisher of India. And now let's get you the latest on the world's largest democratic election in India. Well, as the date draws closer for India's parliamentary elections, leaders of all political parties have intensified the campaign for polls. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi will address two public meetings in Indian states of Bihar and West Bengal. Prime Minister will also address his first rally at Jamui in Bihar today. This would be his first rally in Bihar since the announcement of dates of elections. Chirag Paswan led Lok Jan Shakti Party. Ram Vilas has retained the Jamui seat in a seat-sharing agreement with BJP in National Democratic Alliance. Paswan has fielded Arun Bharati from the constituency, earlier represented by him twice in 2014 and 2019. Later in the afternoon, Prime Minister will head to Indian state of West Bengal. Prime Minister will address a rally at Kuch Behar constituency. BJP has re-dominated Nitish Pramanik, who is also Union Minister of State for Home Affairs, as its candidate from Kuch Behar constituency. Also, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi in a social media post said, and I quote, I look forward to being among the people of Kuch Behar to address a Bengal rally later today at around 3.30 p.m. The people there have been greatly supportive of our development agenda and I am confident they will again place their faith in the BJP, unquote. Also, West Bengal's Kuch Behar constituency is gearing up for a fiery election campaign today. Besides Prime Minister, West Bengal Chief Minister and TMC Chief Mamta Banerjee will also hold a rally in Kuch Behar today. Mamta Banerjee will hold a public meeting in Mata Bhanga's Gumani Hat for TMC candidate Jagadish Barma Basunia. The Kuch Behar will go to polls in the first phase of parliamentary elections. And for more, we have a correspondent, Prasenjit Bakshi, with us on elections. Well, Prasenjit, uh, major rallies in the state today. Uh, on the one hand, Prime Minister Modi's rally, and on the other, Mamta Banerjee is also holding a rally today. Can you give us the details? 
look lipakshi it is a battle uh, to retain for bjp and uh, uh, for uh, trinamool congress to get back kuch bihar or the first phase of election uh, where uh, the three constituencies all went to bjp in 2019 if i uh, if i say that from uh, the uh, northern most part of west bengal that is alipur dwar kuch bihar and jalpaiguri the first phase of election will uh, uh, have in these three constituencies and all three constituencies went to bjp in 2019 so for the last 3 4 days uh, uh, tmc chief mamta banerji is camping in uh, in kuch bihar or uh, this alipur dwar area and today the two um, uh, top most leaders will um, uh, address the um, um, the electorate in kuch bihar as you said in your reporting uh, prime minister will be at 3:30 and in the first half Uh, little after some time uh, mamta banerji will uh, address um, uh, electorate there so it is a interesting battle in the uh, first phase of 19th april uh, when uh, the, the, as i said in my uh, opening note that bjp is will be uh, trying to uh, retain all the three constituencies and mamta banerji trinamool congress is uh, in a battle to regain Uh, on at least one or two of these constituencies that is the focus of uh, trinamool congress lipiksha lipaksi sorry Also, Prasenjit, with West Bengal uh, being a crucial battleground for uh, both the regional and the national parties, the upcoming Lok Sabha elections are anticipated to witness intense campaigning and strategic alliances. Can you give us an overview of the entire scenario in the state ahead of elections, as the polls uh, will be in all the seven phases there? Right. This is a, a, absolutely a, a different type of election for West Bengal, as you know that West Bengal is the third largest in terms of. um number of seats uh, in india after uttar pradesh and maharashtra in west bengal has 42 seats so this is very crucial for bjp to achieve their target of 370 whatever uh, their senior leaders are fixing so this 370 uh, is a target where 42 is a major um, um, uh, contributor would be major contributor in the last election 2019 they uh, could manage uh, 18 seats and um, uh, this time they have uh, uh, kept the target of more than 30 something and for trinamool it is their question of uh, uh, existence i must say that uh, last time uh, 2019 they reduced to 22 which was absolutely unthinkable for trinamool congress and this time if they cannot increase at least by a single number to 23 so that will be a moral defeat for um, uh, trinamool congress this time and on the other hand the two other major forces congress and cpim they are in a in a, in, a, in a type of a uh, battle for existence itself because they are uh, absolute zero in last two, two, 2021 assembly poll and this time if they cannot uh, achieve a single seat for and uh, for congress it was only adhir choudhury um, uh, or and and two other who were there for um, uh, in a strong hold of murshidabad and malda this time also they would uh, try to uh, retain their um, uh, presence in murshidabad and malda but for cpim and the left parties they are in real crisis so in all uh, aspect if i say that bjp is uh, uh, to uh, increase their tally uh, from 18 trinamool congress to increase their tally from 22 CPIM or left parties in an uh, in a in a in a position to maintain their existence and Adhir Chaudhary led Congress Adhir Ranjan Chaudhary is one of the senior most leaders of Congress at the national level so uh, under the leadership of uh, uh, Adhir Chaudhary Congress is also in a battle to remain in uh, uh, what should i say that in in number in west bengal so it is a four corner battle right. in west bengal lipaksi all right thank you so much presented for that information from there And moving on, Congress President Malika Rajun Karge on Wednesday launched the party's Ghar Ghar Guarantee campaign. Under the program, party functionaries would reach out to 80 million households and make them aware of its five sets of promises with 25 guarantees that the party has vowed to implement if voted to power. Karge and other party members also distributed pamphlets about the details of the five sets of Congress promises that have already been announced by the party during the course of Rahul Gandhi's Bharat Jodo Nyay. यात्रा 
And Congress on Wednesday announced a new list of candidates for Indian state of Uttar Pradesh for upcoming parliamentary elections. Congress nominated Mukesh Dhangar from the Mathura parliamentary seat in Uttar Pradesh. He'll be facing sitting BJP MP Hema Malini. The party replaced Nakul Dube with Rakesh Rathor as the party's candidate from the Sitapur Lok Sabha constituency. And in Maharashtra, the Congress has expelled its senior leader, Sanjay Nirupam, for six years for his anti-party statements. Early on Wednesday, the party had removed him from the list of star campaigners for the Lok Sabha elections. The development came after Sanjay Nirupam made a string of remarks against Congress India ally Shiv Sena Uddhav Bhalasab Thakare and its leader Uddhav Thakare after it announced some candidates for parliamentary constituencies in Maharashtra. However, Nirupam had said he would announce his next course of action on Thursday. And senior BJP leader and union minister Dr. Jitendra Singh addressed a public meeting at Doda in Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir. In his speech, a senior BJP leader listed out government's achievements and initiatives for development in Union Territory. Dr. Jitendra Singh said that even the Congress stronghold saw development only after 2014. Dr. Jitendra Singh is BJP's candidate from Udhampur Katwa parliamentary constituency. <laughs> And an Indian state of Assam campaigning for parliamentary election is in full swing. On Wednesday, Assam Chief Minister Himanta Biswa Sarna participated in roadshow in Silchar Town, Kachar District, as part of the nomination filing process for a BJP candidate, Parimal Suklabedya, contesting the Silchar parliamentary constituency. The Chief Minister said that Parimal Suklabedya will win with record margin of voting. Polling for the 14 seats in Assam is scheduled to take place across three phases on April 19th, April 26th and May 7th. And while Congress too has intensified its campaign in Indian state of Assam, Congress candidate Joyram Engleng filed a nomination from Deepu parliamentary constituency. Congress is contesting 13 seats and left one seat for its ally Assam Jatiya Parishad. Assam has a total of 14 parliamentary constituencies. Well, the General Secretary of the Communist Party of India, Dei Raja, questioned Congress leader Rahul Gandhi's decision to contest polls from Bayanad constituency in Indian state of Kerala. Dei Raja said that Rahul Gandhi keeps talking about his fight with BJP. However, for his electoral battle, Rahul Gandhi has chosen to fight left party in Kerala. Congress leader Rahul Gandhi on Wednesday had filed his nomination papers from Bayanad. He will face CPI candidate Ani Raja from Bayanad constituency. When it comes to electoral battle, Mr. Rahul Gandhi has not chosen to fight BJP straight away. He has chosen to fight against left. This is what people are questioning. What message the Congress wants to send out? And the notification for the second phase of the Lok Sabha election will conclude today. Elections will be held in 88 parliamentary constituency seats in 12 states and union territories along with the remaining part of the outer Manipur constituency in this phase. State union territories included in phase two are Assam, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Jammu and Kashmir, Karnataka, Kerala, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Tripura, Uttar Pradesh and West Bengal apart from one part parliamentary constituency in Manipur. And for more, we have a correspondent, Aditya Srivastava, with us. Well, Aditya, today is the last date uh, for filing of nominations for the second phase. Uh, can you give us the details there? Yes, uh, today is the last day of second phase uh, uh, election, election of voting uh, nomination. Uh, there are seven seats in uh, Madhya Pradesh uh, where the election held in uh, 26th April. It is the second phase. Uh, three are from Bundelkhand, uh, two are from uh, uh, when the, the, from Bundelkhand, if we talk uh, Damo, Khachraho, Tikamgar, these are three seats from Bundelkhand, and Riva, Satna, these are two uh, seats are from uh, Wind area, and two more seats are from Central India, like uh, Baitul and uh, uh, Hoshangabad. <coughs> Baitul is a tribal seat of Madhya Pradesh, we can see, 
but yes uh, there are some uh, the top leaders uh, uh, for for this election in this uh, there are some speeches uh, if we talk about the khachra ho bjp president pd sharma uh, 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 by the election in the, at the, again at this time and in tikamgarh uh, union minister virendra kumar uh, and are in the battle so we can say the, the all 20 29 seats election uh, our campaign are very going on in madhya pradesh all top leaders are doing rallies in madhya pradesh especially the uh, chief minister uh, dr dr mohan yadav today uh, uh, will participate in the nomination rally in baitul and narmadapuram and if we talk about the congress uh, congress president uh, state president jitu patwari arun yadav and uh, some of the top leaders of congress are also going to the wind area for uh, participating in the nomination rallies in uh, riva and satna so we can say the election is here in madhya pradesh all right also as you said it is all geared up just two weeks from elections now uh, how is the political atmosphere uh, heating up there uh bjp uh, are uh, are in, in this battle for the, on, the, on the issue of development on the issue of employment and on the issue of youth and women and congress is also uh, uh, today uh, mp congress on uh, ex social media platform ex congress has also posted uh, five guarantees for uh, people of madhya pradesh uh, one for youth for employment for gig workers Uh, uh for women uh, uh, congress also promised that uh, 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 1 lakh rupees uh, give to the women for uh, from every from every year and we can talk about the workers that uh, gig platform workers or uh, you know the migration of workers these are some issues uh, raising by the congress but also yeah, we can say that the health issue is also raised by the uh, uh, congress party uh, employment issue is also raised by the congress party but uh, after all uh, finally uh, what uh, voters thinks what voters uh, support for for, uh, for what party so we can expect that after the the results all right thank you so much aditya for that information from there And Uttarakhand, the hilly state in the midst of the Himalayan ranges, is getting ready for the political slug fest in the first phase of voting on the 19th of April. Ten states, which include one from the north and south and five from the east, along with three union territories, will complete the voting process on the 19th of this month. Why does the hill state matter in the Great Indian Election? Let's take a look. wearing the himalayan range as a crown the north indian hill state of uttarakhand is known for its stunning natural beauty ski and trekking resorts and the hindu pilgrimage sites including the towns of kedarnath rishikesh and haridwar through which the river ganga or the ganges flows the state was part of uttar pradesh since india gained independence in 1947 Uttarakhand became a separate state Uttaranchal in 2000 and in 2007 the state's name was changed to Uttarakhand with a total area of 53566 square kilometers the state has 86% of mountainous terrain and 65% is covered by rich forests with diverse flora and fauna In the upcoming general elections in India, Uttarakhand is going to the polls in a single phase on April 19th. The state, which is classified into two administrative divisions, the Garhwal and Kumaon regions, consists of five Lok Sabha or lower house seats in the Indian Parliament. Uttarakhand has 8.24 million registered voters. The number of male voters stands at 4.27 million. while the number of female voters is 3.97 million around 286 voters are from the third gender interestingly uttarakhand also has 1411 voters who are aged 100 years or above the bharatiya janata party or the bjp has been a dominating force in the state politics as they won all the five seats in both 2014 and 2019 lok sabha or general elections uttarakhand has been popular among tourists pilgrims and adventure seekers attracting visitors from all over india as well as the world 
So as the state goes to the polls, political parties are competing with each other with plans to make the state even more attractive and spiritually more enriching to the world. Antra Sinha for DD India. And still to come in DD India News Hour. In IPL, Kolkata Knight Riders beat Delhi Capitals by massive 106 rounds. We'll tell you more ahead. And in football, former Spanish FA chief Luis Rubeles has been arrested on corruption charges. Stay tuned. Wherever news breaks, whatever it takes. Connecting corners, cutting across continents. Stories that matter from across the globe. Accurate, authentic journalism that serves you right. From politics to glamour, from sports to world affairs. With a fusion of aesthetics and substance. Introducing news in a new avatar. Experience the world through a new lens. Stay tuned to DD India for an exciting journey beyond borders. Welcome back. You're watching DD India News. I'm Lepakshi Kurana and time now for some sports news. In IPL, uh, moving uh, Kolkata Knight Riders beat Delhi Capitals on Wednesday by a massive 106 runs in the match 16 of the season. The VDCA International Stadium was full of cheers for Sunil Narain and Ankresh Raghuvanshi hit half centuries. Sunil Narain a top scored with 85 runs as the Kolkata Knight Riders tore apart Delhi Capitals bowling like cotton candy to post 272 for 7. Delhi in response, lost four wickets in the power play itself. From 51 for four, Rishabh Panth took off. Panth scored 55 rounds and 25 balls, remarkably hitting four fours and two sixes off a Venkatesh Iyer over that fetch to Delhi 28 runs. KKR now stands at the top of the season standings with a win in all their three matches so far. Meanwhile, Gujarat titles will take on Punjab Kings in the match 17 of IPL 2024 in Ahmedabad today. GT's new captain, Shubman Gill, has marshaled them to two wins in three games with both the victories coming at home. Meanwhile, Kings had started their season with a win against Delhi Capitals at their new home in Multanpur, but suffered back-to-back -back losses on the loss road in Bengaluru and Lucknow. And in a major news, Surya Kumar Yadav has been declared fit and is likely to feature in Mumbai Indians' next IPL game against Delhi Capitals at the Vankhede Stadium on Sunday. The National Cricket Academy in Bengaluru cleared the middle-order batsman is set to return after missing more than three months of cricket. The availability of Yadav, who is a number one T20 international batsman in the ICC rankings, will be a shot in the arm for Mumbai Indians. Mumbai Indians have started their IPL 2024 campaign with three consecutive defeats with new skipper Hardik Pandya facing the ire of fans in every match. Former Spanish FA chief and controversial football administrator Luis Rubales has been arrested as part of a corruption investigation on Wednesday. Rubiales, who has been facing charges in the Jenny Hermoso case, was detained in the Spanish capital Madrid after he arrived from the Dominican Republic. The police in Madrid have 72 hours to investigate Rubiales, who came into the limelight after kissing Hermoso during the post-match ceremony after Spain's FIFA Women's World Cup final win over England in Australia in 2023. And let's now go over to Turkmenistan, where the opening ceremony of the Fidetil Sports Competition took place at the State Institute of Physical Culture and Sports on Wednesday. Fidetil is a new sport that combines traditional disciplines with virtual competitions. The names of the direction comes from two English words, physical and digital. This is a kind of a dual event. Participants compete in a video game and its real-life counterpart.
Well, that's all for this edition of DD India News Hour. But let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter and Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Lipakshi Kurana from all of us here in Delhi. Thanks for watching DD India News Hour.